Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Nick with World Compassion here, and I'm sitting here with our president, Jason Law. Jason, how you doing? I'm good. Glad, glad to be here. First time we're kind of doing this, sitting around a table and having a conversation. We're going to talk about the church today. I love the church. I'm glad we're doing this. We've talked about sitting down and having these conversations for really years and the last couple months. Um, we should put it on the calendar and make sure that we're doing it. Yeah, and we are going to be talking about the church and some of the work we're doing in World Compassion, but hey, you just got back from Cuba with the team. Tell me a little bit about that trip. I know one of the things that you said to our staff is that God's really giving you a fresh revelation about your love for the local church. What does that mean? Let's unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so we were in Cuba uh, a couple weeks ago now, and a pastor, um, their church, strong supporters of ours down there helping with some of the church plants. And so we were there laying eyes on some of these projects, you know, visiting the different sites, yeah. these pastors who uh, were either helping to plant a church or, or in Cuba, it's illegal to, to build a church. So they actually have to expand their homes. And so we help them expand as their church is expanding. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have somebody whose living room seats conveniently 100 or 150 people, uh, it's wow. still called their living room. And so we were laying eyes on these just to make sure things are progressing um, with the investments that we're making there as a ministry. And um, one night, uh, my friend who was there ministering was, was just talking about the church. And I felt like God showed something just to me in my heart. And it was, it was a, a, from a position of thankfulness. And no, in no way do I mean this to be arrogant or, mm -hmm. or prideful. Um, but I just God showed me how much I just love the church. I love love the body of Christ. And one of the things that, that sometimes people will say to me, you know, being involved in missions, growing up and traveling the world and doing this and, and getting the lead, uh, now the legacy of my dad, Terry Law, in the work that we do, I get labeled as the missions guy a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time somebody said, oh, you're the, you're the missions guy. And it has always bothered me. It's always bothered me. And at first I thought something was wrong with me that it bothered mm -hmm. me. I thought I was outside of my calling or outside of my gifting or in a place I wasn't supposed to be. And I felt like God showed me, even at a greater level, I, I've, I've, I've caught revelation of why it did bother me earlier, um, because God was showing me there's more. I've got more for you. It's not just this. There's, there's other things. It's beyond just missions and yeah. life that I want you to do and be a part of. And I've been able to do some of those things. But he reminded me again, the reason why it bothers you is because you're not just a missions guy, you're a church guy. Right. You love the church, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that you love my church, that you love the body of Christ, because I love my local church. I love the church that I'm involved with, my family is currently planted in. I love the city church of Tulsa, uh, you know, through some of the Unite My City initiative right. that we've, you've been a big part of that and helping to lead citywide worship events. Sure here in town and connecting with other churches in our city. I love the church, and I love the body of Christ, the global church. I love the church in China that we get to work with, the church in Myanmar or Cuba or Iraq or Iran or any of the countries that we work in. God just reminded me, you just love the church, and, and thank you for loving my church. And I know that sounds like I'm, I'm bragging on myself, but it was like God showed me a piece of my heart um, in a good way, and that's what we're called to. As, right. as World Compassion, we're called to serve His church, we're called to empower His church, because it's the church that God uses to expand His kingdom. Yet right. they're two different things, but it is the church that God uses to expand His kingdoms. There's, there's evil and there's good, there's dark and there's light, and the church mm -hmm. is the salt of the earth, it's the light in darkness, um, and so to the level in which we empower and we equip the church in these environments is how we're going to take dominion, which is what we're called to do, and we're to go rescue people out of darkness and bring them into light, and it mm -hmm. is the church. It is us. It is you. It is me. It's anybody right. who will ever listen or watch this. It's our partners. It's people uh, who call Jesus their Lord and Savior. That's the church, and that is his model uh, for mission. It's our model for mission. So um, he just showed that to me, and, and so I just, you know, this year we're focused on building the church. We're going to build people. Uh, we do that in different ways, but we're also going to build buildings to house people. Yep. Um, it's all the church. I love that. I think um, one of the things that, that I know I struggle with, especially as I was just kind of growing up in church, is this thing, this mechanism of church that we have here in the United States, and then this idea of missions, like we do missions, but really it's the church is on a mission. Like, like it's kind of one and the same. Talk a little bit about like just that idea of missions versus the church being on mission. Yeah, well, one, and I, I heard this years ago, I can't remember if it was from my dad, but growing up, um, missions isn't really a thing. 
you know, it's mm-hmm. a mission. We all just have one mission. That's to go make disciples of all nations, to tell people yeah. about Jesus and make disciples. That's the mission. Right. It just takes place in different places, and people express it and do it in different ways. So um, there's not multiple missions. There's just one mission that the entire body of Christ shares and should walk in obedience to. Now, it can happen in different ways. And I know it's a technicality, sure. but it's also an important reminder. The same mission we have here, churches in Iran have there. Right. Churches in Cuba have there. They read the same Bible. They have the same mission to reach their Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. 100%. And so our mission is to help them accomplish the mission that right. we all share. Right. And when we do that in different ways in each country. Yep. Uh, but I think it's important for people to understand that. But ch- the church, that's why a part of our mission statement, our vision is to take the gospel to nations that are hostile or restricted to the message of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Our mission is to empower the local church to bring physical and spiritual transformation of the lives of people living in those countries. Mm -hmm. So how we do it through the local church is very critical. I believe that's God's model, his plan, and his mechanism. And so, and there's a lot of great spinoffs of that is they understand the language better than we ever will. They Mm -hmm. understand the culture better Mm -hmm. than we ever will. Mm -hmm. They understand the predominant religion that maybe exists within that society or that culture better than we ever will. Um, and there, there's nothing against missionaries going. Jesus said, go. But I believe as we go and as missionaries live in places, uh, I, I strongly suggest and I believe it's you need to build leaders. You need to make right. disciples. You need to duplicate yourself five times over mm-hmm. because you may be called home. You know, During the mm-hmm. pandemic, we saw a lot of people who came home. World Compassion, very few or, or hardly any of our projects or programs shut down. Why? Because we have indigenous local church staff on our staff as World Compassion who are just there to serve and undergird and help lift the arms of the local churches, right. local communities of believers that we are empowering to do the mission. So we collaborate in a partnership with them. So it brings sustainability and it brings great follow-up. So yeah. it's all one mission, no matter where it's taking place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how we do that mission is through the church. It's the body. Yeah. Yeah, because we're all on mission. You and I are on mission here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just as much as our leaders in China or Myanmar or Iraq or Iran or Cuba are on mission in their local countries and their local context. I want you to talk a little bit about just what does the church mean to you personally? Like, you know, we've never really sat down and just kind of heard a little bit about your testimony and your story and like your local church experience here Talk a little bit about like what fuels that passion for you. What fuels that passion? And give us a little bit of that background of like, what's your local church background and context? Yeah, I mean, really, I got to go back a little bit into even, you know, not to be cheesy, but my personal testimony. I grew up as a PK's kid. You know, I was the son of Terry Law. You know, obviously he traveled, he ministered in churches. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home, grew up doing missions work and getting to travel the world, grew up in church. But like a lot of young boys, you know, I kind of did my own thing, went my own (laughs) way, and made a lot of poor decisions, made some good decisions. I was kind of a smart stupid in a way, uh, but wasn't really living for God. Um, A lot of seed sown in my life, a lot of great example, but me personally hadn't made a choice to really submit and live for God. And I was coming out of college knowing that I wasn't really living for the Lord, but knowing the right, right choices and the right path of life that I needed to go on. And Coming out of a, a painful season in college, I got plugged into the church I'm at now, Guts Church here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In that environment, um, number one, the style and the flavor of leadership that my pastor, Pastor Bill and Pastor Sandy, you know, the name Guts obviously is, an, is a different name for a yeah. church, um, but almost being overchurched in a sense, mm-hmm. uh, our church reaches the overchurched and they reach the underchurched. And that, those are the, the two groups really that our church... Uh, um, connects with strongly. sure, And it did with me at a time of my life where I've seen church, I've been in green rooms, I've shaken the hands, I wasn't enamored by the people, I've heard the messages, I've I've had to do devos all the time, like (laughs) I knew better. And this is why I love the variety and the diversity in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But our church gave me a place that was relatable to me, it was comfortable to me, um, but also was very challenging and is a very challenging church culture environment. But it gave me a safe place for me to get my life back on track with God. And it, Pastor Bill gave me a form of leadership in addition to my dad that I could follow. 
and not really knowing it at the time and probably not even knowing it the first five or six years that was there. But now I hindsight, you know, looking back and growing and maturing, it was the connection and has been and is the connection to that family, that body that has allowed me the opportunity to live the life that I'm living now. And I think that's the way that God designed it. One of the verses that we stand strongly on at our church, and it's now something I don't say because we say it at the church, or I don't just quote because the Bible says it, that's important, Mm -hmm. but it's Psalms 92, 13 that says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. And even in old age, they'll be fresh and flourishing. This Mm -hmm. is something that Beth and I have experienced. And so it's one thing to know something, to have head knowledge about God's promise or to know what it says. Read about it. Yeah, you can read about <laughs> it. You can listen to people preach about it. But or it's watch an, a podcast. Yeah, or PBS. watch a podcast. <laughs> and, and maybe this is what we encourage people with. Yeah. And if you're not, get plugged in and planted in a church because I promise yeah. you, you will now experience. Right. You will experience Psalms 92, 13, yeah. and you will see how your life flourishes. And I look at the friends that we have. I mean, there's people mm-hmm. on the board of World Compassion that have come through me being planted at Guts Church that are on this board. There's staff that are in this ministry, have come through this ministry, that have come out of Guts because we've been planted there, that walked us through and helped build things in this ministry in different seasons because I've been planted there. I met my wife there. Our kids are being raised there. My kids have some of our best friends who they call aunt and uncle. Their kids are cousins. They literally have known each other from the womb, like Jonathan or John and Jesus. <laughs> um, they have f- friends giving. We have friends Christmas. We, ha- we go on vacations together. Mm-hmm. These adults pour into my kids' lives. They help raise them. Sometimes they, they receive correction better from them than they do from mom and dad sometimes. Right. And I see this. They instill confidence in my kids. Yeah. They... We're watching our lives flourish at a, as a result of it. Business opportunities have come out of relationships through the, through the church. And so Psalms 92, 13 just became very real to me in the role of the local church in our lives. Mm-hmm. In my 20s, I really feel like even though I grew up in a Christian home, I was discipled through the local church. Right. I was matured. I was, I was brought up as a man in the local church because I had other men who were 15, 20, 30 years ahead of me that would pour into me, that would that help shape me and, and guide me. And now we're kind of that bridge generation, still looking to them, but also pulling that next generation. Right. Reaching up and reaching yeah. reaching back as we see we see our kids kind of begin to step into that those really deep years of spiritual formation. And and I think that's one thing about the mechanism of the local church is that it's a generational work. And even in the work that we do in countries, and and we've talked a little bit about why we do it the way we do and why we empower indigenous people um, to those countries to do the work, it's because we believe in the generational impact of the local church. You want to speak on that for a moment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is how you got... Jesus started with a team. He started with 12 people. And then, you know, Peter on the day of Pentecost goes and preaches a bold message and thousands were added to the church. Yeah. It is the legacy, it's generational church that we have to keep keep passing down. Um, and ultimately, it's our generation's turn to do that. My dad did this and laid a foundation. You know, we're 55 years this year as World Compassion, and it's all I get to do is stand on his shoulders. I get to build on the foundation that he laid. You know, if he built right. three stories, I'm building four, five, and six, and my kids yep. hopefully will build seven, eight, and nine. Mm-hmm. And that's our job is to fulfill the calling of God for our generation like David did. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, I think about Hebrews too, where it says, do not forsake the assemblies of yourselves, especially as you see the day approaching. Yeah. And I think about the environment in the society, the culture that we live in today. And there, you know, obviously it's no secret. People have talked about it on, on podcasts and messages and sermons and debated it and gotten arguments over it about social issues that we're faced with today. And, you know, there's truth in God's word that's not popular in society and culture. And American culture is experiencing maybe a light form of social social persecution based on our beliefs, our scriptural scriptural beliefs. And you're watching the mm-hmm. church, the body of Christ, struggle with you know how we can be all things to all people and how we can be salt and light and and not lose our relevancy and to be able to connect. Uh, with people, but yet still stand on these truths and not turn them away, and yep. and not like we have cancel culture now in, yes. in America. <laughs> and you can, it's, we have cancel culture. We're watching <laughs> the body of Christ struggle with this, right. and 
One, it's like I think we have to be careful not to be critical of people's motives and hearts and how they try to do things initially to try to reach everybody. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we got to be careful that we don't compromise truth. Right. And when we don't forsake the assemblies ourselves together, there's strength. There is a strength, there's a courage, there's a boldness when we come together and we remind ourselves and we encourage ourselves mm -hmm. in that truth. First Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God right. is the pillar and foundation of truth. And when we walk in obedience to God's truth and we hide that deep in our heart and we walk in those convictions, we become the pillars and we become the foundation that is unshakable in society while everything else in the world right now is being shaken. That's what mm -hmm. we're watching happen. Mm -hmm. Those who anchor themselves in the truth of God's word as the church will not be shaken. Mm -hmm. We will be that steadiness. And I'm telling you, the world is going to look to the bride. It's going to look to those in the right. church that have that strength. In the coming years, I believe that revival could follow all of these things that we're dealing with right now because it's going to end up being refreshing to people. Yes. There's going to be stability there. And it's the church, when walking in obedience to God's Word, that is going to be that pillar and that foundation for people to come and to connect with. And for Christ, who's the chief cornerstone, no other foundation but Him, they can begin to rebuild their lives, but we show them the way. And it, But being connected... Being connected to a body is a yeah. big part of giving us the strength to maintain that. When you have a foundation of people that they, they're walking in love, they're walking in truth, they know what, what it means to walk in biblical forgiveness, um, it actually creates a foundation where actual real relationship can happen. Because what happens in our world that I've noticed is people can get offended and just walk away. They just they take their ball and they go home. Talk about a little bit about what, what does it look like to, to do ministry or life together in the context of a local church in the midst of maybe our messes. Well, the Bible says where there are no oxen, the stalls are clean. Okay, so oxen are people, it's us. When we're in the stalls, there's mess. Yeah. Ministry is messy. Church is mess messy. Um, and this is why I think Jesus talks about don't be easily offendable and you got to forgive each other seven times seven. I mean, it is, it is a part of how we are shaped into his image. Our purpose is to be shaped into the image of Christ. And I think sometimes God's sitting in heaven, he's looking down and, you know, people are getting offended sometimes over very little petty things. And they do, they leave churches or they break relationship, um, and really, we're supposed to fight through those and walk in that forgiveness. And as we do, those are the very things that actually shape us into the person that God has right. called us to be. And right. so, I mean, I've been, I go to a church called Guts. And if anybody knew our pastor, I love him to death. I love our leadership. He's going to offend you. Trust me. You know, I mean, he, he has offended me multiple times. And to be completely transparent, there's been times where we've thought about, man, is this our place? Should we really be here? You know, mm -hmm. out of a place of offense. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was writing my book, Unite My City, and I'm writing chapter six or seven that's talking about love is the bond of perfection. <laughs> and it was in that season that I'm writing that chapter that I'm having these thoughts. And all of a sudden, something started rising up in my spirit. If you really believe this, right. you can't walk away offended. Yep. Because love is the bond of perfection. Well, what is love? Love is, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not boastful. It's not like it rejoices in the truth. It's long-suffering. I'm like... Oh my gosh, we can't leave. Cannot leave. And Gotta so stay connected. My commitment to myself and God and to my family was we're not gonna leave until I'm not offended. So naturally what happens? I get unoffended. Well, I don't want to leave. <laughs> now we're walking in the fullness that I think God has for us. Yeah. And so sticking mm -hmm. in a church through offense and actually doing what the Bible says yeah. will actually shape you into the image of of Christ. It, some, shape, it transforms you. There's a maturity that happens when you when you stick that out just a little bit. Yeah, I love that. So we're talking about being connected to local bodies and um, and not being isolated and not being alone or feeling like we're on our own. Talk a little bit about what that looks like or how does this tie into nations that are restricted and hostile to the gospel? Yeah, it, so when we're talking about these countries, do I, I mean, we need this bad in our country right now. When, again, mm -hmm. as we just discussed, the way society and culture is going. But you add some of the struggles, the restrictions, and the environment that people like in Iran are living in or people in China are living in, um, where they have social persecution plus governmental 
persecution, like strong regulations, like in China, illegal to share religious content online. Oh my gosh. How do you stream services? How do you hit me? You know, we had to pull all of our Bible school material offline wow. and we're back into old school printing books and physical MP3 digital devices to, to, to download on and to distribute mm. our, our Bible material on. Like it's, it, there's challenges there because they got different restrictions we do. You know, in Iran, it's not just the regime. Um, right that has regulations on the church that doesn't like Christianity, doesn't want the, want, want the propagation of Christianity, but it could be your neighbor. You never know. Like, we had three people on our house church network right before Christmas who were arrested and put in prison who were at our leadership conference just eight months prior to. Literally sat in a room with these people. We interviewed one of these ladies. These are people who help move Bibles throughout the country for wow. us. They were arrested sitting in one of their living rooms planning Christmas outreaches. And secret police jumped over the wall of their home, broke into their windows and doors, and started interrogating people, questioning people, took their laptops, iPads, phones, wow. and started confiscating information, asking for information about the network of people that they're connected to, asking about Bibles, all of these things. Um, we don't deal with that. And so how do you walk through things like that and be a strong Christian and not want to deny your faith if you're not connected to other people who can encourage you. You yeah. know, 1024 in Hebrews, right before 1025, this is don't forsake the assembly of yourself together, says then encourage one another and love and stir, stir up good up. works yep. in one another. You know, we're doing a great work. People in these countries are doing a great work when they're connected with one another and they can encourage, hey, remind you, we're doing a great work. Mm -hmm. Just like Nehemiah, you're you're doing a great work. Don't come down from this wall. Even though sin ballot and, and these... Yeah. All these people are coming after you and attacking you, and you know there's tough economic times, and there's physical persecution, and there's social persecution attacking you. Don't come down from the wall. Don't come right. down from doing a right. good work. That's what a body of believers yeah. brings, and they need that so much more in countries that are restricted. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, I mean, we're talking about Iran and the pastors, and um, I know some of our international team actually connects with some of our pastors from Iran on a regular basis just to give them reminders and training and, and things like that. Like, how important is it that they realize that, like, as isolated as you might feel as a pastor in Iran, that there is a body of believers across the globe who loves you, is praying for you, and is supporting you? Yeah, every time we go overseas and we're in a room with these men and women who lead these churches that you can just see the excitement of, and I've done this so long, I take this for granted and I overlook it all the time. Just being there, they all of a sudden don't feel alone. Just the fact mm. that we would host a conference for them and they get to come and, and get away and, and have a time of refreshing it, and, and just, it lets them know, not only are you thinking about me, but you care to fly halfway around the world and connect with me. Like, there's people here in the United States, and we're one of the most connected societies in the world, if you want to, in terms of our freedoms. Right. They don't have that. And so how isolated could a pastor there feel versus how isolated a pastor here could feel? How isolated a believer there feels versus how isolated a believer here could feel? And so when they think, oh, my gosh, there's, there's people halfway around the world in another country that are thinking about me. They're giving money to help host this conference you know how much that encourages them? That stirs them up to good works. Man. And so as in World Compassion, you know, I feel like sometimes we're just the conduit. Right. We're we're just the we're just the joint in the body of Christ. You know, I think about Ephesians four sixteen mm -hmm. and I might butcher the quotation of this, but it says, To whom the whole body joined and knit together, according to the effective working of every joint, brings uh, growth, it brings supply. And it brings edification or for the edifying of itself in love. And so it's numerical growth that that's talking about, but it also brings internal strengthening in the body of Christ. But it's the joint that brings that supply. And so just like our arm or our elbow or our wrist here, if you would right. think, like world compassion is one piece and, and all the, the partners and the churches are the hand and um, we're the joint that connects the hand to the, to the forearm to bring that supply, to bring right. that connection, to bring that growth that allows them to go do the work that they're called to do uh, just to encourage them, to stir them up into good works. And so when people partner with us, they give or they pray, um, you know, pastors who might go and help preach and teach in some of these leadership conferences to help train the pastors that we're connected to, 
man, it just reminds them that they're not alone, that they're a part of a bigger body. And right. that's why I love what we do. I love seeing the, the pastors who get to go with us. I love seeing the people that, that we impact. I love seeing the leaders there that we impact. I just love the church. I love the body. Yeah. It's interesting too. Like, I mean, the reality is there may be some people in the room that may live in close to each other and be pastoring in, in nearby areas and have no idea that there are pastors in their, that these people are pastors in their area, but we get to serve as a conduit to be like, hey, you need to meet this pastor. They're nearby you. Um, because how would you, why would you publicly say, hey, I'm a pastor of a church and, and how would you be connected? So I love that World Compassion gets to serve as that conduit um, in that way. And, and to your arm example, <laughs> I, I always think I had this image of like a restriction being on an arm because we work in, in countries that are restricted or hostile to the gospel literally almost like taking off the restriction and allowing blood or resources or support and prayers to flow so that we that these can all work properly. That's a great analogy. Um, it, so that's that's what we try to do in the body of Christ knowing that hey we're all, we are all one body and we want the body of Christ fully functioning across the board. There's not a, a piece of the body that that we want to see hurting, limited, not um, building the kingdom the way the way that God has intended. Yeah, and that's where everybody's got a part to play, um, and we get to be a, just a piece of that. It almost, you know, it feels like an unnecessary middleman sometimes, but man, without a joint, it's it's very difficult to function. If you can try to imagine, if your elbow wasn't there, could you feed yourself? No, we definitely would be feeding each other, right. you know, <laughs> the whole time. So that joint is, is very important, um, and and partners of the ministry who partner with us. That's what yeah. you're a part of is being a piece of that joint where we supply, we empower the local church and nations hostile to the gospel to fulfill the mission that we all have in common. When it comes specifically to the work of World Compassion, how do we engage with the local church in the different countries we're in? And 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 what, what does that look like? What are some of the things that we do? You mentioned conduit. You mentioned that we operate as a joint bringing you know, resources like what does it look like? Yeah, every country can be different. Um, you know, we do a lot of training, a lot of teaching. We have discipleship teaching. We got leadership teaching material. Um, every week, our team is on Zoom calls with leaders in all of these countries. Every week, we're on Zoom calls with 20 to 30 Iranian pastors just pouring into them, teaching, training, answering questions. Um, we physically go and do conferences and teachings and trainings. Uh, so in most countries, there's an element of that that's taking place. Uh, practical things on how you manage money. What kind of systems do you have mm -hmm. in your church? Uh, you know, one church in Burma a number of years ago, I was in my late 20s or 30s when we launched this project, but one of the local churches that we were there helping launch a ministry school that's still running today with their vision to plant 100 churches also had a vision uh, to start an orphanage. We're, right. we're not an orphanage organization. We're not a child sponsorship organization. Mm -hmm. But this pastor, who we had gotten to know for a long time, um, the Bible says, know those who you labor among, yeah. had a heart and vision for this. And every time I would go, there'd be kids laying on his floor. And I remember thinking, I have enough money wrapped around my waist right now to help him start an orphanage. You know, because when you travel, mm -hmm. you're, you're carrying mm -hmm. money for projects and, mm -hmm. and different things. So... Uh, long story short, we ended up helping him launch an orphanage. It was Amazing. his vision, his mission. We just helped him go forward faster. I think about the mobile medical clinic that we that we have rolling in in Iraq, and and they're getting to. I mean, how many people are they reaching on a monthly basis? Yeah, I think I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I don't yeah. want to exaggerate this, but I want to say conservatively, it's five hundred. It might be as high as eight hundred people somewhere in there every month. They are going out and they are providing basic medical care uh, for people in villages, small towns, even some of the refugee camps that are still there, even 10 years after ISIS here, 12 years after ISIS, um, helping to serve those families. But that's a local church, a pastor who we got to know, and just begin to ask them questions. And what needs are in your community that you could go and fill? You know, our mission is we want to help meet the physical needs of people so we can help meet the spiritual needs of people. Mm-hmm. And, and the countries we work in, a lot of times, that's, that's your open door, right. is letting them experience the tangible, the physical love of Jesus, and using that as an opportunity to build relationship with them, have a connection with them, an authentic connection uh, that opens the door to their heart and their mind to be able to have a conversation about Jesus. And so a lot of the countries we're in, you can't, you know, crusades aren't going to work. They're, they're not going to fly. Um, so it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one ministry, but we try to scale that up as much as we can. So mobilizing this medical team 
man, they're serving five, maybe 800 people a month, and every person that comes through gets offered prayer. That just begins to open the door of what's going on in their life and prayer. No one turns down prayer. I think last year, um, it's not a huge number compared to you know Crusades, but this is one, just just one local church in northern Iraq, mm-hmm. a very strong Muslim nation. Mm-hmm. 250 or 275, if I remember, somewhere in there, mm-hmm. people gave their lives to the Lord through that outreach. There's been right. small house churches started out of that outreach, and that, that's just one outreach through that one local church that we do. They also do vocational training, mm-hmm. uh, reaching hundreds of women that are in refugee camps, teaching them a skill set to rebuild their lives, and through those conversations and able to share the gospel with them, right. this is how we build the church. The ingenuity... Um, the empowerment of just coming coming alongside local leaders and local church leaders and asking them what is the need and how can we serve people in your community and empower you to go do kingdom work, go do ministry work. It's such a joy to see because it looks different in so many different contexts, but then it's cool because it's like, no two countries are the same. It is. It's also a marketing nightmare. Like we, we literally had marketing <laughs> professionals be like, "What it is that you guys do?" And I want to be like, "We take the gospel to nations hostile to, to Jesus." Well, okay, but what do you do? We empower the local churches there. Okay, but what do you do? Yeah. We do nine different things, mm-hmm. and but I can't get away from it. So it's a hard like branding, marketing, messaging yep. type mission. Yeah. But I just see the effectiveness of it, and I see mm-hmm. the freedom of it. And it's nothing against. I don't think there's a right or a, a wrong way necessarily to do it. There's there's organizations out there. They do child sponsorship, and they do it well. That's their right. that's their singular focus, their primary focus. They do it well. And but ours is the church. Yeah, we're, and it comes back to what we're talking. It's like I love the church. Like we just <laughs> yeah. want to empower the church to go do what they're they're called to do. Um, and it's one mission, but like we started, there's different expressions of that. And so there's mm-hmm. there's there's different needs in these different countries. Not everything's yeah. the same. Right. And so this is why church planting is a big part of what we do, because yes. out of a church plant can come multiple outreaches. 100%. You have a local church where now we have a ministry school through that local church. They're using our discipleship and leadership training programs. They're using our church planting programs, and they're planting more churches. Well, out of those churches, they can go feed the hungry. They can clothe mm-hmm. the naked. They can take care of orphans if they want to take care of orphans. Name it. They can do it. They can run vocational schools. They can do mobile medical clinics if they right. want to go help medical needs. What right. skill sets are in giftings are inside of that local church that help meet the needs of the community? We want to help empower them to do that. Right. And when you plant a, a church, what Paul calls the pillar or the foundation of the truth, once that is established, it really is about empowering the local leaders to be like, hey, let's go after it and let's go get it. What's the dream that God's put in your heart to, to plant this life-giving thing and then say, hey, let's go reach our community. What does it look like? What are the felt needs? What, are, what giftings do we have? What can we share? And how can we share the message of Jesus? And the beautiful thing about that idea and model is it for 55 years, what keeps World Compassion running is this is this is what we're all about, is working through the local church and empowering leaders on the ground. And this is how you build the church. This is how you do it. And it, there's also a freedom to it, and there's a creativity to it. Um, it's not saying, hey, come in and you're going to do this. A part of empowering people is letting them to discover the gifting that's inside of them, help them to develop that, and then help them to deploy that. Mm-hmm. And in essence, we do that at different levels with different leaders in different countries. Um, and it's it, there's a freedom to it. There's a creativity to it. It keeps you on your toes. It is complex. Yeah. Uh, and from a business standpoint, it it can get complicated, and you can mm-hmm. get committed and stretched too thin. And so, uh, you know, as a leader, that's one of my jobs. Like, hey, we can't overcommit right. because we're doing a lot of different things. It's not like mm-hmm. we have, you know, we're you know Chick Fil A or McDonald's or Arby's or something, and it's like here is our franchise, and we're just going to duplicate it. We're going to scale it up, and it's cookie cutter. It's not cookie cutter. It's almost like cake. Like, you know, like if we're going to have cake, there's going to be some flour and some eggs. Like, you kind of know some of the basic things, but then, you know, you might be throwing some 7-Up in there, and and then it gets weird. Why are there blueberries in my cake? So there's so many different flavors of of the local church. Um, I do want to talk about what does church planting look like in nations that are restricted or hostile to the gospel? I mean, we've got church plants like Cuba, Iran, Myanmar. Like, let's just kind of give everybody a little bit of an idea or a taste of what it may look like in these different contexts, because no two countries are the same. No two countries are the same. Every country is different. Um, and like Iran, it's house churches. You know, they can't, yeah, they're going to have government sanctioned churches. You know, but every country that is restricted has some level of government sanctioned church to put the, uh, image out there that they have freedom of religion or no, we allow Christianity mm-hmm. and you know, a for effort, 
not reality. Um, <laughs> and I don't even know if I'd give an e, A for effort. We might go like a D for effort. But so Iran are, are house churches, you know, where you're going to have gatherings of 10, 12, or 30 people. Okay, let, through American lens, that's not exciting, right? Mm-hmm. A, a lot of people in Western culture, it's like, man, you know, I want 1,000 people in church on Sunday, or man, we're a church of 10,000 people. And I'm going to be honest, that gets me excited, okay? I'm an American. I love American church. Um, I love Gathering. churches. I, I love it. I love the energy and the synergy of a lot of people in a room. Yep. I like it. Same. I'm sorry. Um, but I understand the value and, and I do appreciate, and at times I do like the house church meetings. You know, we're part of a yeah. small group in our church, mm-hmm. our supper club. I love that. I love the connection, the connection, the depth of that. And I see that model in the countries we work in. And so I respect it and I love it, but it's okay for my opinion to be, I love big church. So Iranian church planning isn't necessarily exciting in the sense of how many people come together in one gathering because they can't. Mm-hmm. You know, I shared earlier, we had church rated with right. 20-something people in their living room planning a, 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 a Christmas outreach. If they would have had 100, it would have been a big problem. Dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. And so, you know, we got to be careful as Americans, and, and we do, especially in the work that we do. We don't take our template and say, well, why don't you do it this way? You can do it this way. You have to do it mm-hmm. this way. That's the only way to do church. Yeah. No, that's why God said there's a variety, there's a diversity Mm -hmm. in my body, not only of gifts, but in how we do church and what the church Mm -hmm. looks, the local church looks like in different contexts. So Iran's house churches, when we plant a house church in Iran, we're really not building buildings. We're building people, we're building leaders. And so a lot of our our time or our expense, if you will, is our time. It's me, Mm -hmm. it's our team, it's teaching, it's training, it's the conferences that we do. It is our time making sure that they're following a biblical model of leadership, and no offense, but not the Ayatollah Iranian dictator regime style of leadership, sure. that this is servant leadership. Man, we're here yeah. to wash feet. We're here to serve others. This isn't about you. This is about mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so making sure that they understand these core principles of leadership, what does it mean to be a pastor? What does the right. gift of a pastor mean? What does pastoral right. care look like? Mm-hmm. You know, how, to, how do you take care of pastors who take care of pastors? We're hiring right. two people inside of Iran right now right. to help take care of our pastors because our goal is to double the number of house churches from 56 right. that we have in Iran right now. We're going to double to 120 by August of 2025. So for the next year, year and a half... Our mission is to build leaders, to build yes. people. They're going to provide their houses. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe one day we got to get into some bricks and mortar there. Cuba. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about Cuba. Yeah. Cuba, illegal to build churches too, um, kind of. They can use their homes to build churches. No and commercial it, land. No commercial they, land. They they and as land. long as they have a door into their meeting space that's attached to their house, what I've been told in my understanding is that door is what makes that legal. So here's what's wow. funny is I'm friends with a pastor there, and his garage looks exactly like an American church sanctuary, and it seats 300 people. But it's his garage, technically, <laughs> on paper, so it's allowed. Yeah. So you go in, it's like, well, this is a church. It's a church, but it's technically his house. And so mm-hmm. there's restrictions, but it's not as tight as Iran, so it's a little bit more open. And so you know, there's another pastor who we um, are just wrapping up their project now. They use their master bedroom as their kids' ministry. And it was, you know, it's about the size of the square space we're sitting here. And they put 30 kids in there on a Sunday. I'm like, this doesn't work, you know? And so we helped them finish out their sanctuary, build a second floor, um, another little space where they can move into. And then we rebuilt some rooms where now they have some kids' spaces. And so it's their wow. house, but it's also their church. Sure. And so house church there means something a little bit different than house church in Iran, mm-hmm. where Iran, it's literally their living room. Mm-hmm. A Cuba, it's their house, right. but it also looks like a church in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Myanmar is probably a little bit more like Cuba. Um, mm-hmm. They're going to live in their house, but it's also their church. If I'm listening to this podcast and I'm a believer, what what would you say is like the primary takeaway when it comes to just how we're talking about the church and missions? What do you want people to take away from this? Uh, number one, um, man, I, I want people to experience church like I've experienced church. And, and more importantly that, I want people to experience church how I believe God intended us to experience church. And, and to be planted in a church, you know, and you're hearing this from a guy that some, gets quoted as leading a parachurch organization. And that might be a separate co- podcast because I actually don't like that terminology because it gives an uh, indication that we're separate from or we're apart from the church rather than a part of the church. Mm-hmm. And we're a part of the body of Christ. Um, we're not separate from, we are connected to Mm-hmm. But people need to be planted in a local church, following a pastor, submitted underneath a pastor and his teaching, and submitted underneath the leadership 
of that church, that spiritual authority that comes from that. And I, I think I do a good job of exampling that. We've been at our church and yeah. under our leadership, we serve as elders there now. I'm a part of actually the executive leadership team now. Um, we're connected and we're planted. World Compassion is its own entity. We have our own board of directors. We make our own decisions. But Pastor Bill, Pastor Sandy, and the, the other elders in the church, they carry a high level of influence in my life, mm-hmm. high level of influence in my mm-hmm. life. And what do I, how do I define being planted? You attend regularly. Um, you're serving, you're connected, you're serving the body, and that you give, you tithe. I mean, again, this is coming from a guy who has my own budgets to meet and my own ministry, uh, payroll to meet, funding all the projects, all the things that we do around the world. My wife and I tithe to our local church. That's mm-hmm. where we're fed. We tithe to our local church. We give beyond our tithe to our local church. Mm-hmm. We give to World Compassion. Mm-hmm. We want to be generous people. That that is mm-hmm. that's our our ministry model. Yeah. But um, I want people to be planted in the church. I want them to experience the flourishing. And I understand there's going to be offense. There's going to be people that make you angry. And I'm asking you to fight through it and don't allow the enemy to win and just take the stance that I'm not leaving offended. And mm-hmm. watch, you're not going to end up leaving. What what's going to happen is you're going to end up taking off a little bit more of that old creation. And you're going to keep putting on Christ, that new creation. You're going to put on love, That's which right. Colossians 3.14 says, the bond of perfection. And it's going to bond you into that body tighter, and a spirit of unity is going to begin to flow through your life. And I believe that revival follows unity. It starts in us, and it spreads around, but it has to begin with putting on love. So I want people, number one, to experience experience being planted in a church. And and more than anything, this isn't like a ministry podcast, but if this is a ministry moment, that. And then number two is people to care that other people experience that in some of the countries that we work in. You know, um, I'm always, I want to invite people to be a part of what we're doing. I want people to think as world compassion as maybe a piece of their mission strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, people, most people aren't going to countries every every month or every week, but the amount of communication that we put out on social media or email and hopefully now these podcasts and letters that we send out is to keep people abreast and aware mm-hmm. and updated and reported of stories and impact yep. that we're making. And the Bible says wherever your treasure is, your heart is there also. Do people have a heart for mission? And as you give to what we are doing, this is a piece of you. It's a piece of your heart. It's a piece mm-hmm. of your being. It's a piece of your mission. We are a missions outreach and by doing that, you're giving people and nations that are restricted or hostile to the gospel the opportunity to be a part of God's church. I love that. I think the world is getting getting smaller and smaller through through digital everything, but also the church is getting smaller and smaller too. Like the ability that we have to impact the global church is literally right on our doorsteps within just a few clicks away. Um, to find out more, go to worldcompassion.tv. Thank you so much for listening and joining us. We'll see you next time.